On the line with us is the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author of a new book, Reign of Terror, the subtitle, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump. Spencer Ackerman, uh, foreverwars.substack.com is his website. Uh, you can tweet him at, at Ackerman, A-T-T-A-C-K-E-R-M-A-N. Uh, Spencer, welcome to the program. Uh, tell us about how 9-11 set the stage for Donald Trump. Certainly. It does so in a couple ways. First, there's a deliberate imprecision after the attacks uh, to not define the enemy. The enemy is not defined narrowly as the people who caused the attacks, but extremely broadly. And in fact, if you look at, for instance, the authorization to use military force, which kicks off the Afghanistan war, it's not defined really at all outside of allowing the president uh, to do that definitional work. And accordingly, once all of this, you know, machinery coalesces, it creates opportunities to push American society in a more authoritarian direction uh, through the expansion of uh, mass surveillance, uh, through uh, indefinite detention, through torture, through uh, putting immigration in a counterterrorism context. And as time goes on, the nativist current that uh, exists kind of in symbiosis of those two things understands not that Al Qaeda or you know Osama bin Laden is responsible for the 9/11 attacks, but that they are symptoms of something that they see pathological within Islam itself, both overseas and here amongst their Muslim American neighbors. And as the war grows more and more disastrous as something that's supposed to showcase American power, instead showcases American weakness, then this offended sense of American exceptionalism amongst people who believed on the right what their leaders had told them experiences now this kind of cognitive dissonance, that these people who the U.S. is fighting, uh, who are understood to be practically subhuman, somehow have beaten the United States of America that has gone this badly. And at that point, then you also have uh, lying in wait an opportunity for someone to come along and say the problem is that these elites don't understand the war that they're in against radical Islam, and they only have discredited themselves and brought you this humiliation. Only I can fix it, and the way I will fix it is with doubling down, accelerating all of the civilizational elements of the war against which violence is licensed, and then using it more expansively against people who we see as our domestic enemies, not only Muslims, but black people like Black Lives Matter, or anti-fascists uh, who will now be dealt with by joint terrorism task forces. And we saw this really visibly on the streets of cities like New York and Washington and Portland last summer. Yeah, wow, that's a, that's a, 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 a startling synopsis. We're talking with Spencer Ackerman about his new book, Reign of Terror, how the 9-11 era destabilized America and produced Trump. It, 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 without getting as, as granular as you just did, I, uh, from a kind of a, a, a 30,000 foot uh, view, I, I, I re it almost seems to me like what 9-11 did, the, not 9-11 itself, but the way that George W. Bush and, and Dick Cheney chose to respond to it, you know, keeping in mind that uh, Bush had told his biographer in 1999, Mickey Herskowitz, that if he became president, he was going to attack Iraq, that his father made a terrible mistake you know, pulling out of Iraq after less than a week, that uh, the you know the the uh, war really should have gone on long enough to get him reelected, and that he wouldn't make the mistake that his dad did. Uh, you know, he would get more political capital. But but looking back, my dad, uh, you know, uh, out of high school, joined the army to go fight in World War II. By the time he got there after boot camp, uh, it was over, and he ended up being part of the Japanese occupation. But he spent most of his life using basically racial slurs to describe Japanese and German people. You know, Japs and Krauts, words that, you know, are not, they don't have quite the sting now. Um, and, and my generation, you know, that went off to Vietnam, I, I didn't, but I knew people who did, 
um, used words that are that I, I won't use on the air to describe. Yeah, we don't need to say we don't need to say them. We, but right. I think the point is clear. Yeah, and so and so the World War II, we had to create an other, and you had to sli somewhat dehumanize them. Then in, with the Vietnam War, we did the exact same thing, and then it seems to me that George W. Bush did this with with Muslims. And then Donald Trump came along and said, okay, let's continue this tradition and do it with, with people coming from south of the border. Um, it's, it's almost like a, every, tw every generation has to have their own, you know, racial bad guys. What do you think? Well, I think this is American history. This is the legacy of a country. This is, this is the sort of the resting natural state of uh, the United States of America that exists because of settler colonialism that sees itself as having the right first to dominate uh, an entire continent um, to include, you know, using the tools of genocide to do so, and then from there, the entire world. And amongst the most uh, defining actions that it takes throughout that history is to treat human beings as chattel and to set up a circumstance where in perpetuity the descendants of those people are to be a permanent second-class citizenship and it only makes sense that america would conduct its wars like that what we have to understand as well you know you mentioned you know you say each generation you know does this well what does it mean when those wars don't end right. what does it mean when they become part of the permanent architecture of what the American government does. I think the answer, you know, is on display from the way you, you set up the question. Yeah. That's going to be what happens to our Asian American and Pacific Islander neighbors as the bipartisan Cold War against China coalesces. I was just thinking. Whether, this... whether, 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 any, whether any elite official who for, you know, detached reasons of policy believes that, you know, simultaneously the United States ought to pose, you know, so-called great power competition to China and also abhors racist violence against people of Chinese origin in the United States. The effect is nevertheless clear. The effect is nevertheless obvious. The effect is nevertheless demonstrated historically. Will we choose to do this again, or will we break with it? You know, it's it's um, it, kind of the cultural norm is increasingly in America is to say um, you can't trash talk other Americans who are of Chinese, Japanese, uh, Muslim, you know, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Afghan ancestry. I mean, fill in the blank, African ancestry. You can't trash Americans based on their racial. Uh, you know, or ethnic heritage, but it's okay to trash countries, and we're seeing this explosion of anti-China sentiment, particularly in the GOP right now. Um, you know, and Trump with the China virus and all this kind of stuff. Uh, how do we break this cycle, Spencer? Spencer Ackerman, do you have any thoughts on that or any insights into that? Well, I'm a journalist, so this isn't my lane. So everyone, you know, take that accordingly. But you can't have states of war, you can't have states of uh, now, you know, organized around imperial competition, which is what this so-called great power competition with China really is. It's a war over resources. It's a yep. war over, you know, winning proxies um, and, and determining uh, whose geopolitical, which is to say geoeconomic influence will dominate without their being once it is, you know, a distinctly ethnically or, um, you know, re religiously or, or, you know, fill in the blank, you know, de definably other civilization. Without that civilizational element, which is both violent and will be expressed through violence, you know, you, you, you can't have the—you you can't have—it's just unrealistic— and kind of risable to think that you can have this without the racism that we have seen so many times follows it. It is right. always a thought experiment. Yeah, well, you point amongst, out how amongst, differently. Amongst the least. 
yeah, it's always a thought experiment that, well, of course, these are intellectually separable things. Sure, they are. But the effect is nevertheless the same. And if you are going as, you know, a leader um, to be advocating this, then you have to reckon with the fact that you are opening the door to very predictably racist violence. Right. And you point out in the book how different we responded to Tim McVeigh killing over 300 people in, in, you know, with the terrorist bombing in Oklahoma City following the script of the book, The Turner Diaries, uh, compared to how, how we responded to 9-11, which was done by people of a different race and a different religion from another country. That's correct. I think that through looking at the response to the Oklahoma City bombing, we really see the war on terror in contradistinction and accordingly in full. We see who the war on terror targets and we see who it exempts, even when the behavior is fundamentally similar, even when the conspiracism is fundamentally similar, even when the ambitions are fundamentally similar. What we, we just have 45 seconds left before we're going to hit a hard break here. What, sh how should George W. Bush have responded to 9-11 uh, so as not to open this door? Uh, he should have accepted the peace deal with the Taliban that the Taliban offered in December 2001. He should have targeted for arrest and prosecution only the members of al-Qaeda involved in the plot, and that should have been it. Then yeah. he should have taken, he obviously wouldn't have done this, but then he should have taken the country into a long, hard look at what the wages of American imperialism are, what the wages of being a global policeman are, and then start to relinquish those claims. It never would have happened. This was a, this was a government run by oil men. Yeah. But nevertheless, that was right then. Yeah, absolutely spot on. It's a brilliant book, Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump by Spencer Ackerman. Uh, foreverwars.substack.com uh, really worth signing up and, and following Spencer and, and at ATT Ackerman uh, on Twitter. Uh, Spencer, thank you so much for dropping by.